بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده ولا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما ورزقنا فحم النبيين وحفظ المرسلين اللهم افتح إلينا حكمتك وانشر علينا رحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام وصل اللهم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الكرام ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم So first and first of all I want to apologize last week's session uh, I was not feeling well I'm still recovering from from a cough. Uh, it was a dry cough. There's no infection. It was just my voice had gone. So I couldn't really speak. So even now I'm still going to be coughing. So I do apologize when I break in between. The, um, we will continue with inshallah the same text that we were looking at, the Hikam of Ibn Ataila, and then we'll go back into logic as well. There's something I want to clarify now that we've gone at least somewhat into the hikam. There are, the, the hikam itself is not organized in any particular topic or any such. And so what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to group certain points that he's made and I'm trying to give them a, a certain theme around that. That doesn't apply as a standard. That's just my own categorization. In many instances, I mentioned before that some of the hikam are going to connect to others several points down the line. And, you know, there's going to be sort of a back and forth thing going on. So that's going to be there. But what I'm trying to do is trying to accommodate because there are almost 260 or so um, aphorisms. And I don't want to have any of those pending by the time we are done with the course. I want to cover all of them. So I'm going to try and group them together like this. And... Uh, there are other aspects of the hikam also that you will find now. I know some of you guys got some translations. I strongly recommend not to follow those translations because the translations have been made mostly from an oriental, orientalist's perspective. Um, they've just translated plain text and they've put certain understandings because these are not things that you can just translate and understand. You really have to go in depth into the words that are being used and how they're being used because there's a lot of rhetoric that is going on there's a lot of poetry that's also going on so i strongly don't i i, I strongly recommend you do not rely on those translations try and understand the texts in as much as the way it is being uh, articulated in the original arabic even though you don't understand arabic you're not trying to understand the arabic you're just trying to understand the core message of each one um, then you've got certain pointers that always arise that are very shaky when it comes to tasawwuf as a subject, as a science. There are certain things that people would quote, a scholar might quote from a certain other scholar who was probably deemed a deviant or something, you know. There are certain Sufi aphorisms, you would call them, mystical aphorisms that are very... Uh, borderline and phantasmical. These are the things that when you look at translations, you will not get it. Um, it will either lead you astray or it will paint a completely different picture in your mind. So these are the things that I'm going to highlight as we now progress because we've already passed through the initial sort of introduction to the text. Now we're going into the core of it, the heart of it. So we, we stopped at number 16. Yeah, number 16. So we'll go to number 17, and I'm going to take the next 10 up until 20, 27. Yeah. Actually, we'll do up until number 24. Because 20, 25 then starts off on a different theme.
26. We'll do up until 26, inshallah. Yeah, 26 will be fine. So he says, number 17, he says, مَا تَرَكَ مِنْ جَهْلِ شَيْئًا مَنْ أَرَادَ أَنْ يُحْدِثَ فِي الْوَقْتِ غَيْرَ مَا أَحْدَثَهُ اللَّهُ فِيهِ In your version there, it is غَيْرَ مَا أَذْهَرَهُ اللَّهُ فِيهِ They have the same meaning, just the word is different. أَحْدَثَهُ means to make happen. So hadtha is what happens. A hadith is recounting what had happened. So that's a, a narration of what happened. So ahdathahu, he makes happen, and adharahu, he manifests it. So what he's saying here is, nothing has left, has been detached, ma taraka has been detached from ignorance, min al jahli, shay'an. Nothing from ignorance has been, has been left out from. One, man arada an yuhditha fil waqti, one who wants something to happen, at a certain time, غَيْرَ مَا أَذْهَرَهُ اللَّهُ فِيهِ Other than what Allah has manifested in it. I wish it didn't happen like that. I wish this had never happened. I wish this, I wish, you know, I so wanted to happen like this, but it just, that, that sort of thinking is part of jahiliya. It's not part of intelligence. Wishful thinking, what you call wishful thinking. He says then, إِحَالَتُكَ الْأَعْمَالَ عَلَى وُجُودِ الْفَرَاغِ مِنْ رُعُونَةِ and, and yours says, رُعُونَاتِ uh, nafsi. It's the same, it's just uh, in the plural form. إِحَالَتُكَ الْأَعْمَالَ عَلَى وُجُودِ الْفَرَاغِ مِنْ رُعُونَاتِ النَّفْسِ The remittance of your deeds, doing action, performing a'mal, when it is leisure time for you, in other words, delaying action until it is convenient for you is from the frivolities, ru'anat, is from the frivolities of the self, from the ego, the trivialities of the ego. Delaying action, procrastination is one of the things human beings are very well known for. Procrastination, delaying the action until it's convenient for you. You know, I'll do this when I, it's best. You can hear the adhan being done, but you're busy doing other things. And then you, you say, okay, I'll pray when I'm a little bit free. Let me finish what I'm doing. That, that thought is from the ego. That's the nafs that is doing that. La tatlubhu an yukhrijaka. And your version says, La, la tatlubu an yukhrijaka minhu. So, La tatlubu an yukhrijaka minhu. Halatin li yasta'amilaka fi ma siwaha. Falaw arada sta'amalaka min ghayri ikhrajin. Don't put yourself in this, in this thinking, in this mode of thinking that he can only make use of you if he removes you from your current state. Because if he wanted to make use of you, he can make use of you as you are. There's another form of thinking that comes out of this. If I had more money, you know, I would be able to do charity. If I had free time, I would be able to study. If I was, so you're thinking about a different state than you are in, meaning your current state, as it goes back to the previous aphorism, is not convenient for you. So you can, you're thinking that you can only be useful to servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is if your state was better, if you are in a better state. If I just had, you know, uh, passive income, then I would have to, I would be able to do so and so and so. And if I just had this, then I would be able to do so and so and so. You see? Ma aradat himmatu salikin an taqifa inda ma kushifa laha. The passion of a salik. So this is the theme now. If you if you've grasped it by this aphorism, the theme is the theme of the salik, the one who is on the path. So you're on the path of ihsan. So he's highlighted for you three things. He's highlighted for you the ignorance that arises from wishful thinking. And then the frivolity that arises from convenience, from thinking of your own convenience. And the lack of acting because you think that your current state is useless. 
or you are useless in your current state. The salik does not take all that as an excuse. Those are not excuses for the salik. The passion of the salik, the, 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 the desire that he has does not cease when things are unveiled for him, when, when the unveiling takes place. Except that reality then calls out to him and says, that which you seek is ahead of you. This is not the destination. So the passion does not die out of the Salik who is on the path, he's on this journey. His destination is the divine presence and he is going through this world is part of his journey, reality calls out to him and says, that which you are seeking, your destination, is still ahead of you. And he cites from the Quran here, Surah Al-Baqarah, the externalities, the formations of this outward world, they call out to him and they say, indeed, we are but a trial. So don't disbelieve. That's the Salik who recognizes that this is the journey. This is not the destination. This is just the means for me to reach the destination. Tolabuka min huttihamun lahu. The word talab here has got different meanings in each of those phrases. Talaba means to seek, but in its application has got different meanings. So the first one he's saying, Talabuka minhu ittihamun lahu. You are demanding from him because talaba means to seek. So when you're seeking, you're asking for, you want something. This is the demand now because the context of the word is applied in meaning of what it is that is being sought. So the seeking or the act of seeking is dependent on what it is that is being sought. So your demanding from him is impeachment of him, accusative. You demanding from God, I want this, is you accusing him that he is not providing for you, is impeachment of him. وَطَلَبُكَ لَهُ غَيْبَةٌ عَنْهُ And your, your seeking from him is due to your absence from him. You're seeking him because you're absent from him. You're looking for him. If you were in his presence, you wouldn't need to seek him. And you searching from him, are you, uh, and you searching and you searching for other than him is due to a lack of shame in you. That you would look for other than him. <clears throat> And you asking from other than him is due to your presence distanced from him. So you demanding from him is an impeachment of him. You seeking from him is because you are absent from his presence. You searching from, for other than him is your lack of shame before him. And you asking from other than him is due to your presence distanced from him. Ma min nafsin tubdihi illa walahu qadarun fika yumdihi. There is not a breath that you exhibit, that, that manifests, except that to it is a decreed destiny that, that proceeds it. There is a decreed destiny in every breath that courses it, that makes it manifest. Don't 
anticipate separation from the vicissitudes, from the alterities, from the turbulences, the causes and effect. Don't anticipate separation from that. You are in this world. Because that then separates you, severs you, it cuts you off from the presence of a state of observation, of vigilance, attention, muraqaba. This is that second part of the statement of the Prophet wasallam when he was asked about ihsan. He said, tarahu, fa in lam takun tarahu, fa innahu yaraka. That first portion of serving Allah as you can see him, as though you can see him, that is the state of mushahada, of witnessing his presence, not with your eyes, your, your, your inner being. The second is you serving him, um, even though you cannot see him, he is seeing you. That is a state of muraqaba. That's in a state of vigilance. Yani you are under surveillance, you are under observation. So trying to, dis to, to, to dissolve yourself away from the vicissitudes, the troubles, the trials, the tests that Allah has put you in, is you actually severing yourself from those things that keep you vigilant, that keep you observant of his presence. In what he has established for you. He's the one who has established you in that. So, in other words, remain vigilant of him observing you irrespective of the circumstance that you are in. Because the circumstance you are in, he is the one who has put you in it. And he has put you in it as a trial so that you can be attentive. You can be vigilant of him. Don't find it ajeeb. Don't find it strange. Like phenomenal. Don't be astounded or amazed at the, at the happening, at the occurrence of of sorrows, of trials and tribulations, of distress, of grief. Don't, you're, you're amazed, you're astounded by that. What a shock. It's not shocking. Because as long as you are in this world, in this realm, that's the nature of the realm that you are in. It is, for indeed, it demonstrates to you, it demonstrates to you, it's rightful characteristic. That's the nature of the realm. It's only demonstrating to you what it is. And it's necessary attribute. It is inseparable. It is a realm of sorrow. It is a realm of grief. It is a realm of turbulence. This idea that you can construct yourself a utopia of peace and quietude and everybody is just smiling and singing kumbaya and exchanging gifts and all these things. That's, that's fantasy. That doesn't exist here. This is a realm of turbulence. In it, there are moments, there are gaps in which there is peace and tranquility awarded. There is some enjoyment. The Quran testifies that. But its nature, its very nature is that. It is grief. And as he said before, the realm is dhulma. It is darkness. There's nothing absolute in this realm. Peace is not absolute and war is not absolute. These are all relative. They come and go. And this is why they're called the vicissitudes of time. They're ebbing and flowing. They come and go. So don't be amazed when that happens. Accept it and deal with it. Ma tawaqqafa matlabun. Matlabun. Anta talibuhu bi rabbik. Wala tayassaru. Wala tayassaru. ولا تيسر مطلب أنت طالبه بنفسك. The quest that you seek with your Lord is never halted. It's never stopped. It doesn't cease. The quest that you seek with your Lord is never halted. 
But the quest that you seek by yourself is never facilitated. It's never easy. It is never expedited. It is never simplified. It's always complicated and it gets even more complicated because you're doing it by yourself. <clears throat> من علامات النجح في النهايات الرجوع إلى الله في البدايات. From among the signs of success in the beginning is the turning to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Ah, sorry. In the نهاية. For from among the signs of success in the end is turning to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala in the beginning. This is what's complementing the previous one. Your quest with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has sent you into this realm. So here you are now, heading out. Achieving this, to achieve that, to achieve that. All the goals, aspirations, hopes and everything. That which you try to pursue by yourself without your Lord's assistance is going to get more and more difficult. That which you pursue with his assistance is never going to end in terms of it's it's uh when i say and not, not that it will never get finished but in terms of what it it yields for you the, the 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 promise that comes from it the fruit that it bears the gains from it would not end so from among the signs of success in the ending when you reach the destination is you turning to your lord in the initiation in the first place and this is why as muslims I mean, if you understand the deeper meaning now of why we begin whatever we begin to do with Bismillah. It's not just a statement that you're making. It's really you are invoking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the initiation of it. And there are many hadith that demonstrate that there is no blessing in what you do if you do not start off with Bismillah, with the name of Allah. Man ashraqat bidayatuhu the one who rises to shine in the beginning, thereby rises to shine in the end. So one who seeks Allah's help and mercy and guidance from the very onset, that person begins to rise and shine from the beginning and thereby in the ending is going to rise and shine as well. So we'll stop here, inshallah, because now he's going to go into a different concept. And he's, he's going to go more deeper into the actual suluk. This will be interesting, inshallah. Okay, so we'll stop here next week. We will start off with number 28. Yeah, 28. We did till 27, inshallah. Let's get started on... Uh, the subject on logic. So we did the, we started the 10 principles, Mabadi, Al Ashra, and I'm going to do a lot of repetition as we go along because one of the techniques used in teaching is repetition. It's not just for the purposes of memory, but um, but repetition actually is more beneficial to understanding than it is to memory. You can repeat something a hundred times over and it might not retain in your memory. But if you understand its concept through that repetition, then that will retain in your memory because that's how the mind functions. So we said that the mind has got three operations. The grasping of a concept, the ratification of a concept, of the concept, and then the reasoning and argumentation of it. So those are the three main operations of the mind. And that's what logic pertains, the three operations of the mind, because that's what logic is about. It is about the mind and its operations. The, the 10 principles, so we looked at the first three. إِنَّ مَبَادِي كُلِّ فَنِّنَ عَشْرَةِ الْحَدُّ وَالْمَوْدُوعُ ثُمَّ الثَّمْرَةِ وَفَضْلُهُ وَنِسْبَةٌ وَالْوَادِ وَالْإِسْمُ الْإِسْتِمْدَادُ حُكْمُ الشَّارِعِ مَسَائِلٌ وَالْبَعْدُ بِالْبَعْدِ اكْتَفَى وَمَنْ دَارَ الْجَمِيعَ حَازَ الشَّرَفَى The last line there says, the one who masters all of these ten, that one is the one who comes up with excellence. Because you can master one of these, or, or two or three of these, 
yeah, you'll get the knowledge of the science. You see, there's a difference between knowing something and the knowing of something. Like I know about this doesn't mean I know it. You see, I know about Christianity because you heard that there are Christians somewhere. Doesn't mean you know what Christianity is until you master it. So that's the, there's a difference there between knowing something and knowing of something. And typically sciences are knowledges of a thing because a science studies what is there in reality. A science doesn't study what doesn't exist. Like the example that I gave, you've got physics because you have a physical universe. If you didn't have a physical universe as the object of study, then there is no point in having a physics because what exactly are you studying in this case? So we looked at the first three, Al-Had, which is the definition of the science and what it is defined as. We looked at the name and where it is derived from. And then we looked at the subject matter. And the subject is what we say regards the three operations of the mind. Tasawwar sadij or just tasawwar, tasdiq and qiyas. Comprehension or grasping the concept, ratification, concluding what it is and how and whether this or whether that through differentiating it from other things that are similar to it and then reasoning it out. Why do you think that it that is what it is? What's, what's your evidence? What's your proof? What's your argumentation behind that? Those are the three operations of the mind. So then the fourth one, the fourth principle is the thamra. What is the benefit of the science? Because if it has no benefit, why are you studying it? So according to Imam al-Ghazali, logic is an introduction to all knowledge and the one who has not mastered it cannot be relied upon for his knowledge at all. This is what he records in his Mustasfa. He says, Hiya muqaddimatul uloom kulliha. Okay. Okay, the, the Zoom, could you mute yourself? <laughs> um, where was I? Hiya muqaddimatul uloom kulliha. وَمَنْ لَا يُحِيتُ بِهَا فَلَا ثِقَةَ لَهُ بِعُلُومِ أَصْلًا this is, this is a muqaddima of all the sciences. Like, or every science you want to pick, this is the introduction. And, and he makes a very bold statement. He says, one who does not master it cannot be trusted for the authenticity of his knowledge. That's an incredibly bold statement to make. I mean, we've got ulama that just like, I would say 90% of scholars in the world haven't studied logic just judging by the way they present themselves and, and the arguments that they make. It's, it's really astounding. And the statement Imam al-Ghazali is making is a very bold statement to say that one who doesn't study science, uh, the, uh, logic, that person's knowledge cannot be trusted for authenticity. Now, he's not referring to the knowledge that is retained in the mind in terms of knowledge of, but knowledge itself in terms of what is his understanding. That's what he's referring to. There are many people who have criticized the statement and said, oh, this is just rhetoric. It's not rhetoric. He's got a very valid point here. As you say, there is knowledge of, and then there is knowledge itself. Uh, uh, the actual understanding of a thing and just knowing about the thing. You see, you know that that, that something is, you know that, the, you know that there is something called the, the stock market. Doesn't mean you understand how it works, but you know that it's there. You know that there's something called the stock market. So you can get that kind of knowledge, which is knowledge of, by memorizing the texts. You know, someone can memorize the entire Mus'haf, the whole Quran memorized. Doesn't understand two words from it. Maybe understands what Bismillah means, but doesn't understand two words from it. Doesn't have knowledge of the Quran uh, or doesn't have an understanding of the Quran. He's just memorized the text. The same case goes to many of these ulama, they come out, this is what their, their training is. They've been called. It's not really study per se. It's more of an indoctrination. They know the text. They know the opinions. They know the, all these variances. That doesn't make them knowledgeable. And if they cannot reason, if they cannot provide you reason in terms of reality, mutabaka, to tell you that, you know, this is the reality. This is how the knowledge is applied in the situation. Because there are a lot of things now. I mean, this kind of the state of the world that we are living in now. There are a lot of circumstances now that the fatawa that have been issued in, in history, in our tradition, 
they wouldn't apply to current situations. It's, it's, it's almost impossible to use those, those opinions in any case, like, like monetary economics. You, you can't apply those fatawa to the kind of in the financial instruments that are in use today. You've got all these ulama giving half-baked fatwas about, about the law of darura, or oh, it's a necessity, so you know you can just get interest mortgage because you know you factored it in. Inshallah, Allah will forgive you. You know, these are these are nonsensical opinions because they don't understand how to reason out what it is that they are examining, and they're just using pre-recorded texts, you know, it's just regurgitation. But true understanding of a science has to be reasoned out. You have to examine a thing, analyze it, know exactly what it is, what is its definition, you know, what is its description, what is its, um, how do you construct its syllogism, how does it apply, what propositions are you analyzing, what are the terms used in those propositions. These are things that the trained mind only can do. And logic is that instrument that is used for training. So that's what his argument is. The, the, it, oh, so where were we? Its greatest benefit derives from the clarity of thought and sound reasoning skills it engenders in one trained in its art, coupled with more effective and, uh, uh, with more effective oral and written communication. It orders the mind, it structures the mind, it entrains the mind. In the same way that if you want to participate in an athletic event or in a certain sport, there's a certain training that you have to go through to get in shape, to get informed, to learn, to acquire the skill of it, to hone that skill. The same applies to the mind because you're going to go out and analyze something and you've never understood what it is and you don't even know how to analyze it. So Ghazali's statement holds true for many of these scholars because you see the, the scholar... <clears throat> The, the knowledge that you acquire has got two aspects. There is naqli and then there is aql, aqali. Naqli is the naql, the, the copying of, you know. You, you're basically just copying what has been done before. A lot of scholarship is based on that. And it's not to belittle it. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, like a foundation of, of scholarship. You know, you can't just disregard that and start the whole thing all over again and try to reinvent the wheel. No, you have to understand what the previous generations studied and what are their opinions and what did they do. This is moving from the known into the unknown. But it doesn't just stop at the knuckle. It has to progress into the akal. And so when it comes to the, uh, to the application of reason now, that is where they tend to fall apart. And if an individual has not really studied the, the instrument itself that helps you to reason, then you know you can't trust that person to give you a valid opinion. It's always shaky. It's never rooted. The, 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 the reasoning is not sound and it's not properly articulated either. And then now, so people would then ask the question and say, well, what? So the Salaf, they were because they didn't study logic, right? The first three generations, the Sahaba. They didn't study logic, so what, their knowledge cannot be trusted? Well, he actually argues and says that as far as the Salaf are concerned, there is a unique um, aspect that's applied to them. Because they were individuals who were clear of mind. And what's happened with the generations is that that clarity has started fading out. I would further argue on that and say that because it's a unique precedence, you are a generation that is in proximity with the revelation of the Quran and the Prophet himself. So whatever is being relayed now in terms of knowledge revealed is, is taken directly from the source. Later generations are not in proximity of that. And the further away you are from the point of revelation, the lesser your understanding of it. And this is why the understanding of those individuals was, was right on spot. They didn't need to study fiqh. They didn't need to study uh, aqidah. They didn't need to study, you know, nahu and sorf and all these other sciences. They didn't need to do that. In fact, many of those, they are the ones who founded those sciences. 
But they didn't need to do that because they were in proximity of revelation. They didn't need to study kalam. They didn't need to study philosophy because they were getting that knowledge in its purest form directly from revelation and the Prophet wasallam. But we're distanced from that now. We're taking on, you know, transmitted knowledge. And the further away we are, the more it becomes necessary to have certain instruments that enable us to rise to that level of understanding. That's the argument that is made here. Then there are the topics, masail. What topics are covered in logic? The topics of minor or formal logic consist of simple apprehensions, concepts, terms, definitions, divisions, judgments, propositions, their varieties such as simple and compound, affirmative and negative, categorical, hypothetical and modal, opposition and conversion. It should be contradiction and conversion, but that's fine. Uh, reasoning, the syllogism and its divisions, and finally induction. Material or major logic deals with the contents of the syllogisms and involves categories, the five predicables, five arts, logical fallacies, topics, related subjects are dialectic, rhetoric, psychology, cosmology, and criticism. Don't get overwhelmed on this. He's just, um, these are all the topics that we will actually cover and we will go through each one of them. But this is basically the, you know, looking at the forest for the trees. So if you have that PDF that I sent earlier that has the logic tree, uh, maybe I'll just, yeah, we have time. Maybe I'll just go through these um, different points that he has highlighted on that tree. But you're going to constantly be referring to that tree because that's what's giving you the map of the science. So you have the science. This is the map. These are the different sections. And we're going to be looking at all these different sections. And this is how they're all interconnected. So traditional logic had, which is different from now, what modern logic is. Modern logic is more analytical, uh, you know, you've got the kind of logic that is, it doesn't have any form of dynamic aspect to it. It's very precise and it's useful insofar as quantitative fields like computer science, especially you've got things like Boolean algebra and that. But traditional logic had this sort of dynamic between what's being studied and how it's being articulated or reasoned or demonstrated. So you had formal logic and material logic. Now, formal logic doesn't mean formal like, you know, in, uh, like formal informal, you know, that it doesn't mean that. It means the form that is constructed in the mind, the imago. That's the formal logic, the logic that's constructed in the head. And then material logic looks at the individual constructs of that form. So informal logic is where you have got these arguments that are constructed, things like syllogisms. You have deduction and then you have induction. Deduction is istinja, uh, istintaj. Istintaj, yastentiju, uh, yes, yes, which comes from the root word nataja. From that, you also have the derivative natija. So the conclusion, what's drawn out. That's what istintaj is. It's deducing particulars from universals. This has got hypothetical deduction and then categorical deduction. Hypothetical deduction is where you have syllogisms constructed. The hypothesis, you're hypothesizing. You've got conditional syllogisms, disjunctive, and then conjunctive syllogisms. We'll look at all these because... We're going to come to the section on syllogisms. We're going to look at all these, how they're constructed. A conditional syllogism is like saying, mm, if, it, if it rains tomorrow, the streets will be muddy. So the muddiness of the streets is conditional upon the falling of the rain. That's a conditional syllogism. It's true, which means if it doesn't rain, the streets will not be muddy. Unless somebody pours water, then it becomes, so now you're actually building the syllogism, you see. Unless somebody pours water, then it will become muddy. But if there is no dirt or soil, then it will not be muddy. But if there is dirt or soil, it will become muddy. So th this is how you're constructing. But the initial syllogism, the initial, what you would call the, the premise is conditional. If this, then that, that's a conditional. Disjunctive typically uses the, the, the but. So you've got these three propositions that are used. There's the if, this, then that, you've got the but, and then you've got the and. And is conjunctive. 
So the conjunction of two propositions coming together. We'll look at those det in detail as well. Then you've got categorical deduction, which is the second branch of deduction. That's got three parts. There is judgment, there is deductive inference, and simple apprehension. We're going to go into detail of that as well. Induction is what you call istiqra, yastaqiru, um, to, to basically investigate or examine. It comes from the root word qara, which is to read and recite. So that's what you're doing. When you're reading a book, when you're reading anything, you're, you're looking at particulars because each word is a particular and, and, and each word has got different particulate meanings. So you're trying to determine which meaning is being applied in the sentence that you're reading, right? So if I read, uh, if, I, if I read a sentence that says the book was on the table, so there I have to now figure out, okay, maybe I'm not really referring to the book, but I need to understand the table in this case. The word table, it could mean breakfast table, dining table, it could mean floor table, coffee table, bedside table, which table? Those are all particulars and it's me trying to induce a universality from that. So that's induction is the movement from particulars to forming universalities or, or universals. And deduction is the other way from universals into particulars. This has got three portions. There is complete induction, incomplete induction, and analogical induction. And we'll do those also, inshallah. Then you've got material logic. So that's that was what they call um, major logic. The, the Sorry, minor logic. That's formal logic. That's the minor logic. The major logic is material logic because that's what makes up the content of the argument. And that's where the biggest task lies. Forming the argument is not difficult because you're just using propositions. If this, then that. If this and that, but not this and that, but then this or not that, this is just, you're just formulating an equation. All you need to know is which symbols are you going to use? Plus, minus, divide, multiply, which one will you use? The main aspect is material logic because that's what looks at the content itself of what's being reasoned. So you've got three aspects of the three main branches of material logic. You've got modes of being, modes of knowledge, and modes of argumentation. What a thing is, how is it formulated or whether this or whether that, and how is it argued? Again, the three um, functions or operations of the mind. Modes of being are, are parted into two. There is the comprehension and then there is the extension because you've got the comprehensive and then you've got the extension of it. The, the comprehension are the 10 categories the substance, quality, quantity, relation, position, time, place, action, passion, and possession. So you've got substance. So the way Aristotle put it is he, he took the substance and then he had nine from that. So total, they make up 10. But the substance is the main thing, what you call jauha, the essence of a thing, because you've got, you've got something and then you've got nothing. Something and nothing. Both of these are things. They are existent. They're not not like nothing is not non-existent. This it's still existent, but nothing is that which doesn't have substance. Something is that which has substance. It's got jauhar. It's got an essence to it. So this is something because it has an essence. It's got the essence of a book. And that tells me that it's got a value that is intrinsic to it. There's something in it that I would hold it with respect. I wouldn't burn this. I wouldn't tear it up. I wouldn't throw it in the garbage, you see? But, you know, like a piece of scrap paper might be nothing to me. It doesn't have any substance in so far as I'm concerned. I could probably throw that in the bin. Then you've got the quality of a thing, the kaifia and the quantity, kamia, how much, the howness and the how much of it. What's its quality and what is its quantity? Then you've got the idafa, which is the relation. Because each thing has a relation. Everything in creation has a relationship. The only 
true and absolute is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why logic only applies to this domain. It doesn't apply to that. You can't apply logic to try and figure out who is God or what is his nature or what is the qadar or what is this. You can't use, use logic in that. And we'll look at the prohibitions of it uh, in the 10th principle. But everything has a relation. Knowledge is knowing a thing's proper place in, in, in so far as three relations are concerned. In relation to itself, in relation to other things, and then in relation to its creator. So everything is relative to everything else. Then you've got the position, which is the wada. What is its placement? Like this, it's on the table. That's its position. If I say it's under the table, then that's incorrect, right? It's on the table. Its position is, is noted to be on the table, not under the table. And then it's time, mata, when. This wasn't here two hours ago. So I can't say that at two o'clock the book was on the table. That's incorrect because at two o'clock it was not on this table. It was somewhere else. That is its time. Each thing has a time and a place. Um, and then it's it's fi'l, it's action. What action is it performing? What what act is it doing? What is it is it like if I'm talking about uh, an individual, he's sitting on the chair or he's standing in the corner, or he's going to the masjid, or he's doing this, he's doing that. What action is that person performing? And then there is the infi'al, and then there is the milk, the, the, the milkia, the possession of it, the possessiveness of it. The, the, like, so this belongs to me, that belongs to you. So I can't say that that belongs to me because its relation and its possession has been established to belong to somebody else. Those are the 10 categories. We'll go into all these. And when we start doing examples, you'll be able to understand how they're applied. That's the comprehension. And then you've got the extension of each thing. These are the five uh, predicables, the jins, the naw, the fossil, the khasa, or what's known as aradun khasa and aradun amma. These are the genus, the species, the differentia, the specific and the common or the accidental. Then you've got modes of knowledge, and these are also three. There is definition, argumentation, and division. Three basic ways of knowing things. By defining a thing, and that's got four aspects of, of its definition. There's the formal cause, the material cause, the efficient cause, and then the final cause. The formal cause is the form itself. What is it? The, the, like the form itself. That's what it is. It's form. It's a glass. Then you've got the material cause. What is it made of? It's made of glass. And then it's got the efficient cause. Um, the illa fi'liya. Who made it? Where did it come from? Where, where is its origination? Then you've got the final cause. The conclusion of it. What's the finality of it? That's the complete definition. In argumentation, you've got three basic arguments. Necessary arguments, probable arguments, and then fallacious arguments. Necessary arguments are arguments that have to be made. There's no other work around that. For example, if I argue that because there is creation, there has to be a creator. That's a necessary argument. It's not a probable argument because having creation necessitates a creator. A probable argument is like the one I said about rain. If it rains tomorrow, the streets will get muddy. Well, that's a probability. It's not certain that it's going to rain. And it's also not certain that the streets will get muddy because again, there are conditions and variables that might not make the street muddy. A fallacious argument is just fallacious. It's just incorrect. I ate an apple, my stomach hurt. Apples are poisonous for human beings. That's a fallacious argument because I ate one apple and then my stomach hurt. Then I draw the conclusion say, therefore, apples are poisonous for human beings. That's fallacious. The fallacy is actually, it's called a hasty generalization. And we'll look at fallacies as well, inshallah. If we have, we might dedicate a session to look at as many fallacies as possible. Then you've got division as a mode of knowledge. Division is basically just breaking things down. 
into different categories and then analyzing each piece independently instead of trying to take on everything in one go. I've seen this mistake being done by many. I've seen this mistake done by many. Like sometimes I get emails of, um, I mean, I don't like to call them that, but they do sound like eschatomaniacs, you know. <laughs> the world is coming to an end. You know, they want to collect everything into one presentation. So we'll be talking about the return of Nabi Isa here and then something else over there and then something else over there and then going back to this one again and just connect, trying to collate too many concepts into one go and give a single argument out of that. You know, then the conclusions that are typically drawn end up being fallacious and, and incorrect. So division is a way in which the mind can operate soundly by breaking things down into smaller categories or topics or subjects in the, in the same way that we're doing. You see, like for the, for the Hikam, I'm trying to break it down into small, small pieces. This is not breaking things down into bite-sized pieces. That's not what it is. Division is trying to make frameworks within the bigger framework and then analyzing it individually, understanding that, and then examining how does it fit into the bigger framework. So each smaller framework, how does it all connect together? And then how does it fit into the bigger framework of the main subject that you're studying? That's what the, this is. Then you've got modes of argumentation. You've got judictive, dialectical, rhetorical, poetic, and these can be applied in, in many other um, avenues, like uh, those that are mentioned here, psychology, cosmology, criticism, rhetoric, dialectic. These are different modes of argumentation, like the judictive argument. If you're arguing legal um, points, you don't use poetry to argue a legal precedence. You know, you have to use the law and it has to be clear and concise and precise. You know, if you're arguing in terms of, let's say, uh, physics, like, like you're giving a, a theory, you don't use rhetorical arguments in physics because how, why are you being all this, you know, fancy sophistry in there? You have to use dialectical arguments because it's an analytic field of study. So each, each domain has got its own mode of argumentation. That's essentially it. That's the roadmap. That's the map work of logic. You've got formal logic, material logic. Formal logic has got deductive, inductive. Material logic has got modes of being, modes of knowledge, and modes of argumentation. Modes of being has got the five predicables, the 10 categories. Modes of knowledge has got the definition, the argumentation, and the, uh, the division. And this argumentation is different from modes of argumentation. So you've got necessary arguments, probable arguments, fallacious arguments. Those can be applied in any of these modes of argument. You can be fallacious in legal settings. You can be fallacious in poetics. You can be, you can provide necessary arguments and as well as probable arguments in legal and all these other uh, settings. So those are modes of argumentation. That's the roadmap. Try your best to draw your own diagram. Don't use that, the one that I gave you. That one's really... Um, it was just for illustration, but draw your own. I, I'm, I'm using my own from my own notes way back in, I don't know when I studied this. I don't even remember. My handwriting is so different. I couldn't read some of the words I've written. <laughs> so try and draw your own map and, and, and put your own notes and all that. And inshallah, we'll be doing each of these in this, uh, in this um, science, in this subject as well. So those are the complete the topics that are going to be discussed in, in the science of logic. Then you've got the istimdad, the sources. What sources does it derive from? Yes, tamiddu min in which source is it deriving from? So tafsir derives its source from the Quran. Fiqh derives its source from the Quran and Hadith, and some scholars also use the Sirah. So where does logic derive its source? From which science does it derive? What logic itself is unique. It doesn't derive from any science. Logic does not derive its sources from any other science. It is the singular introductory science, and its sources are observation and intuition. 
Logic's basic tools are intuitive concepts, intuitive concepts, and the concomitant propositions that stem from them. Concepts involve the mind's abstraction from universals to particulars. That's your deduction, which enables definition. Propositions involve composing, um, composing or separating concepts in a subject or predicate form upon which judgment is based. We'll look at what this is, subject and predicate. These two operations of the mind are how we reason deductively or inductively in the third act of the mind, which is argumentation or demonstration. So the first two operations of the mind is the concept and then how the concept is formulated. The propositions involve composing or separating concepts, whether it's this or it's that, is it this, is it that, some sort of elimination take, takes place in there to arrive at a judgment upon which now the judgment is based. So that's the second operation, that's tasdiq. In the third operation, which is argument and demonstration, is where these two first operations are now reasoned deductively or inductively in the third act, argumentation or demonstration. These three mental operations are the sources of logic, which essentially an uh, which is essentially an analytical inquiry into these acts of the mind, which enable us to reason soundly and avoid the pitfalls common to an untrained mind. Its sources and foundations, such as the laws of identity, non-contradiction, and the excluded middle, are rooted in self-evident truths. That is any truth, the opposite of which is impossible to conceive. So these three operations of the mind, this is what logic is based on. This is what logic studies and analyzes. That's it. These three uh, uh, operations. Grasping a concept, understanding uh, how it is formulated and drawing a conclusion from it, and then arguing it or demonstrating it in terms of what the mind has now formulated. They abide, these, these abide by these three laws. There are many other laws, but these three laws are foundational. The law of identity, the law of non-contradiction, and the law of the excluded middle. I'm going to go through this just briefly right now, but you, you will grasp it as, it as we do the actual science later. The law of identity is, is the identity of a thing. It is what it is. That's the law of identity. A thing is what it is. It's, it's, that's its sameness, what, what it is, its correspondence. If I say a glass of water, that's what a glass of water is. That's not what a glass of water is. So this thing is what it is. That's, that's the, its identity. If I call it something else, then that's not what it is, right? So that's the law of identity. The, the other one is the law of non-contradiction. A thing cannot be and not be at the same time. <laughs> so a thing can't be if it is and at the same time not be. So this thing is a glass of water. It, it is a, it, it, in, its, in its current state, it's a glass of water. In its current state, I can't say it is not a glass of water. It either is or it isn't. You understand? So a thing cannot be and not be at the same time. It either is or it is not. The two otherwise would contradict. If I say that the sun is shining outside and then I say the sun is not shining outside, so which one is it? Either the sun is shining or it's not shining. It can't be both at the same time. And this is part of intuitive knowledge as well that every human being comes uh, uh, equipped with. No, no one teaches you that. Like two things cannot occupy the same space at the same time. Or a thing cannot be in, this, in, 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 in two places at the same time. That's, that's the nature of this world and that's intuitively understood. And this is why the logic that we're studying only applies to this world. This would not work in quantum physics, for example, because in quantum physics, particles behave in very strange mannerisms. Like a particle could be in a positive state when observed, but negative in, when it's not observed. That just doesn't make sense. Or a particle here could be positive and another particle here 
and they've got no link in between them, no connection, no cause, no effect, nothing. But if this particle changes its state to negative, then this one also changes its state to negative. And there's no way of describing what has happened there. Einstein was confused about this. He called it spooky. <laughs> it does make sense to him. This is why the logic of this world doesn't apply to, to quantum. Now, that doesn't mean that quantum is now some mystical realm. No, it's still part of this physical domain, but it is subatomic in the sense that the logic that we understand as far as the grasping, the function of the mind, doesn't work on a quantum level. And this is why this idea of trying to look for consciousness in, in quantum you know, fields, it's a completely nonsensical idea because consciousness itself is not, it's not physical, it's not material. It's an immaterial entity. It's just using a material entity, which is the brain, to function in this world. But it itself is not material. Anyway. That's, so that's the law of non-contradiction. Then you've got the law of the excluded middle, which sort of complements the non-contradiction. So the, the excluded middle is, it's either this or it's that. There is no in-between. So it's either daytime or it's nighttime. It's not, there's no in-between in there. The in, there's no, the in-between would be something else, would be called like evening, or it would be called dusk or something like that, twilight. But it's either night or it's day. If you look outside, it's either day or it's night. If it's not night, it's not day, then it's something else. That's the excluded middle. Now, there is a fourth law that some, like the, the Indians developed this law in their line, in their, this going way back. They called it the law of the included middle, which would apply to very unique circumstances. And in this case, I would say it would apply to something like quantum physics that a thing is and is not at the same time because certain observations take place in quantum that, that, that are very strange, that cannot be categorized in any of these other three laws, but would maybe fall into that third, fourth law. But that's not our subject of discussion in any case. So those are the three laws, the law of identity, non-contradiction, and the excluded middle. Try, try and memorize that. Just like grasp it, don't memorize the words themselves, just grasp what it is. Because once you grasp it, it becomes intuitive for you because that's how the mind functions anyway. Then you've got number seven, which is al the founder of the science. Reasoning is elemental to the human condition and we are all gifted naturally with powers of reason that govern our actions. According to Muslim sources, logic is a codified science, was first developed by the ancients and remained latent some claim hidden until Aristotle recorded its rules, defined its terms, and then revealed its secrets. This is part of what you'd call like mythology, because I mean, there's some truth to that, I would probably argue that it was something that was developed because there were many sciences that the that the ancient peoples, they didn't, they held it in elite levels of society only, like the common men were not allowed to to indulge in those sciences. And some traditions like the Jewish tradition, I think they still do that. Like the common man is not allowed to touch the Torah in terms of reading it. You have to do it with the rabbi. I don't know if they still do that. In some Christian traditions also, it's there. There are certain sciences that the common man is not allowed to get into. So this was what some of the Muslim uh, they thought that, you know, this was a science. I mean, you could even argue in this, like Idris alayhi salam was someone who was who was essentially in, in, in many um, accounts is regarded as the first one to actually do science. Like he was taught, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the gift of understanding astronomy from which mathematics is derived, um, alchemy from which um, compositions of materials and manipulation of elements is derived. So some of these things, these require logic. And so without logic, you really can't grasp these sciences. But it's a myth, so just leave it where it is. But Aristotle is basically regarded as the founder of the science because what Aristotle did was he would observe his teachers, Plato and Socrates, and observe what they were doing in their arguments and so started noticing these patterns that they would be applying. And so he then codified them and he became the founder of the science of logic. Aristotle's six books known as known collectively as the Organon 
are considered the first books on logic, and thus he is arguably the founder and the first teacher of logic. His six books include the categories, the interpretations, the prior analytics, posterior analytics, topics, and um, sophistical refutations. All this, these six books are summarized in the Isa Guji. So we'll be looking at those in a sort of a simplified format. Um, in the Islamic tradition, Al-Farabi, who is considered the second teacher, introduced logic into Islamic civilization. Later, Ibn Sina attempted to provide for the Muslim world what Aristotle did for the Hellenic, Hellen, Hellenic civilization, an encyclopedic work covering logic, natural science, mathematics, basically the quadrivium, and metaphysics. The logic section of his book, Ashifa, became the basis for Arabic logic, which differs from Aristotelian logic in some areas, because he sort of tried to Islamicize it. So the Hellenistic tradition, you have to understand that the sciences developed by any civilization is foremost based on their understanding of reality itself. And part of that understanding is contingent on their theological understanding. So the Hindu, their, their, Basically, their tradition is polytheistic. And much of what they produce in terms of sciences is based on that worldview. And it was a similar case with the, Hellenic, with the Hellenistic Greeks before them converting or taking on a form of Judaism that accepted Christ as a prophet. They were individuals who were polytheistic and pagan in some aspect as well. So these things sort of seeped into many of the argumentations that came in. And this is why the scholars, they were not happy with Greek philosophy and logic coming into Islam. And many refutations have been written against that. But scholars like Al-Farabi, Ibn Sina, uh, Imam Al-Ghazali, even uh, Al-Kindi, um, they all try to sort of refine these sciences and polish them up, remove the elements. This took a long time because a lot of trial and error had to be done. So after mastering Ibn Sina's work, so Imam al-Ghazali mastered Ibn Sina's work and then he refined it even further. He removed what he deemed any objectionable aspects of it and wrote five works of varying levels of difficulty for students of knowledge. These are Mihakun Nadar, Mi'arul Ilm, Mizanul Amal, Qistasul Mustaqim. Which one am I missing? Mizanul um, Amal, I believe. Those are the five books that Imam Al Ghazali wrote on logic, specifically on logic, but then he includes logic in other texts as well. In the Ihya'u Numuddin, in the Mustasfa, which are his basically his prime texts. Now, the relationship to other sciences, the nisba, what is this relationship? Because in the Islamic tradition, no science is isolated. Every science has a connection to every other science. And this is how the Muslims always uh, approached knowledge. Unlike modern West, which basically looks at very specific and particulate, Muslims had a holistic approach to the sciences and knowledge. This is why you get scholars who are polymaths in Islam. Um, so every science has a relationship, but logic is unique in this sense. Its relationship, to, its relation to other sciences is that of a universal to a particular, because it's basically connected to every science. So it doesn't have any specific relations. As all other sciences are comprised of concepts, propositions, and arguments. That's the nature of every science. Every science has got concepts in it, has got propositions in it, and has got arguments in it. It is filled with assumptions, it's filled with equations, it's filled with formulas, it's filled with formulations, diagrams, all these things are part of what the human mind constructs because that's what a science is. We didn't discover science. Modern West, secular, they like to argue in this area. You see, human beings, we were dumb and stupid and living in caves. And then suddenly somehow somebody discovered how to make fire. And then suddenly somehow somebody decided, discovered how to plant things. And then somehow out of the blue, after so many millions of years, we discovered science. And here we are now, we are able to do this on smartphones. This is the modern Western kind of thinking. But the religious way of thinking is that it's not a discovery of science that the human beings did. It's a construction of it. These are the tools that the human mind has developed in the same way that Aristotle used observation and intuition 
to look at what his teachers were doing and he built a science out of that to say, okay, here's the instrument of what these guys are doing. In the same way that Imam Shafi is the one who developed the science of fiqh in our tradition. That doesn't mean that people were not doing fiqh before that, but he's the one who observed what his teachers were doing and he made a sort of a set guideline to say, this is the methodology that is applied and it has been tried and tested. And this is the nature of a science is that it should be falsifiable. A science has to be falsifiable. In other words, the contents of the science have to be open to replication. You need to be able to duplicate the theories. If you can't do that, or if there is a prohibition on doing that, then it's not a science, it's, it's doctrine. And this is why tasawwuf is considered a science because all the methodologies that are used in tasawwuf can be duplicated, replicated, and then falsified if need to be. Falsified doesn't mean to be made false. Falsified means to try to falsify it. You see? So if physics tells you that water boils at 100 degrees, how many of you have ever tried that? To actually do the experiment. Many of us just take it as it is in the text. But that theory is proven true because it has been attempted to be falsified. And you can try it yourself and put the thermometer and put the water on, on heat. And at 100 degrees or somewhere approximately there, it will start boiling. That's your falsifiability of it. And that tells you that the theory is true in the science itself. So that's the nature of a science is that it is of a human construct. We have, we develop it ourselves. We didn't discover it like it was sitting somewhere on a tree and then somebody went and just found it and said, ah, science, this is nice. That's not how it worked. We developed it. It took time. It took years. The concept of gravity, for example, Newton's discovery. It wasn't a discovery. He only discovered something within the science or within the theory itself that enabled him to understand the concept. That's what he discovered. But the theory itself has been debated centuries before him, going back to Muslim, um, uh, 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 um, uh, Muslim scientists who argued about uh, gravity. There were Indian uh, physicists before that who argued about gravity. There were Greeks and Romans before that who argued about the concept was there. It was just a means or a mode that he discovered that helped him understand the concept. He didn't discover gravity. It has always been there. In the same way that Einstein didn't discover, you know, relativity, which in itself is arguable as well. They didn't discover these things. They just discovered the means to which, by which to understand the concept. That means is what is then codified into the science because it is replicatable, it is du you can duplicate it and then you can falsify it. You can run experiments and produce your results and say, according to these results, this is wrong, this is right. You can do that. As such, logic is sui generis. It is unique in its own uh, class. Although categorized among the arts known in the West as liberal and in the Muslim world as instrumental. In the, in the Western world, it is this is liberal. This is not going to get you a career. So if you want to go be an accountant or a lawyer or a doctor or an engineer or this, that or the other, logic is not going to benefit you. That's according to the Western world. Yeah, but if you want to go into like poetry and literature and drawing and painting and all these things, you can do logic. That's how they've categorized it. But in the Muslim tradition, it is min uh, ulum al ala. From, the, from among the instrumental sciences, meaning this is a requisite knowledge. You can't go into usul al-fiqh without studying logic. You just cannot. It's not possible because the text itself requires you to make logical reasonings and arguments. So number nine, what is its virtue and rank? Fadluhu, aw sharafuhu, aw rutbatuhu. What is its virtue and its, its rank, its darja? Given its universal benefit vis-a-vis -vis other sciences, logic is an overarching science. Its subject matter, which is concepts, propositions, and arguments, propositions and arguments, is integral to every other science. It's integral. Like it's, you will apply it to every science. Every science has got concepts, has got propositions, has got arguments. 
Hence, scholars have always considered it a natural propedeutic, proper, I cannot pronounce that word, propedeutic subject, meaning it's primary, it's preliminary, it's a requisite, and a means to sound knowledge. While as ends, other sciences surpass logic in rank, its supreme virtue is as a means that ensures intellectual rigor in the pursuit of knowledge. This is important. You have to understand that logic, though it is important, it is it is got its virtue, its rank. It's not the end. It is just a means to an end. It is a, it's something that will help you better understand the ultimate objective. So you want to understand tafsir, for example. You want to understand the Quran. The Quran makes logical arguments. There are many logical arguments. When we go into syllogisms, there are many examples that they've given here. But look at some of these and you'll be astounded to see how logically sound they are. Well, to understand that, you need to understand how propositions work and how concepts work and how arguments work. So that's that becomes preliminary. But it's not the end, which means it's not the instrument that once you get logic, you know everything about everything. It doesn't work like that. It's something that's going to take you and help you understand the other sciences, such as now tafsir, that will help you understand the Quran. And in order to understand tafsir, you have to understand language and literature and nahu, sarf and all that. Well, in order to understand how language works, you have to understand how logic works because that's what logic is about. It's about the word. When we go into the text next week, inshallah, you will, you will understand because it, it deals with the word. He begins the text by saying, Allah do dalla bil wada. He's referring to the love. That's what logic pertains. It pertains the words, the uttered, the spoken word. And finally, now the hukmu sharia. The hukmu sharia, the, the opinions of scholars can be categorized as those who consider the study of logic. Number one, recommended. Number two, permitted. Number three, a collective obligation. Number four, prohibited. I don't know about this order of, I would probably put collective obligation first, and then permitted, and then recommended, and then prohibited. But anyway, we'll just follow the form that they have. So the first opinion that is recommended is that most theologians, legal theorists, and many of the jurists, or is that of most theologians, legal theorists, and many of the jurists, including Al-Ghazali, Ibn Arafah, Al Ubbi, Al Sanusi, and this is the soundest opinion according to Moscow. So the majority or the most dominant opinion is that it is recommended. Recommended primarily is if you're going into the sciences. The second opinion is that logic is permissible for those whose intellect is sound and who have knowledge of the book and the Sunnah. This is the opinion of Taqiyuddin as Subki, and it is also my opinion. This is the opinion I would probably align with. Sound mind or sound intellect, because the intellect has to be has to be able to understand the parameters of its intellection. How far or where does its limitations lie? The intellect loves to speculate. It loves to look for inquiry. It loves to interpret. That's its nature. It delights in those things. Knowing where the limits lie, that requires sound intellection. The second is knowing or, or having a, a knowledge of the book and the sunnah because that's what keeps you within the parameters. So aqidah is one of those things that helps you remain within the parameters of operation, of intellection, when it comes to the belief. Otherwise, you start speculating on the nature of God. Is he this? Is he like that? Does he have hands? Does he have eyes? Does he have this? Does he have that? Well, the Quran tells you, Laysa So if you didn't, if you didn't, if you knew that, then you would use that as the starting premise to say, there is nothing like unto him. So if I'm thinking about eyes, it's not him. If I'm thinking about hands, whatever I formulate in my head, however, whatever, whether it's a hand with unlimited number of fingers, whatever I formulate in my head, it's nothing like unto him. It's not him. You see, that tells me 
Because that understanding now tells me this is the limit. I don't cross over here to try and reason this out. To try and understand the Qadr. Because Qadr doesn't work cause and effect. That's not how the Qadr works. Qadr Allah. The power of Allah. Or, or predestination or what he decrees does not work with cause and effect. Cause and effect is just the final destination of it. The Qadr begins from the Amr. From the, from the Arsh. And transcends, descends the seven heavens until it enters our domain. So the cause and effect is only in the last domain. And logic only deals with this domain. It doesn't deal with the Samawat. This is why when you dream, dreams don't make sense to you. You can't apply logic to dreams. Because you're not dreaming in this world. You're dreaming in the other world. You're dreaming in the, in the place where the soul comes from. Which is a spiritual domain. So the logic doesn't work. It doesn't give you a rationality behind that. The third opinion is that it is an obligation. This is the opinion of Al-Qutub Al-Tahtani. Mentioned by Al-Ajhuri and Al-Zarqani in, in the book, the chapter on Jihad and the commentaries of, on Al-Muqtasar. So Al-Qutub Al-Tahtani, there were actually two of them in Damascus. They taught at the same uh, madrasa and they actually lived in the same house. So And they had the same name. So... <laughs> To differentiate them, one was called because he lived on the ground floor, the other one lived on the upper floor. So one was called Al Tahtani and the other was called Al Fawqani. So Al Qutub Al Tahtani, the, the one below, and Qutub Al Fawqani, the one on top. So that was the opinion that they hold that it is an obligation because, again, going back on what Ghazali said, it becomes foundational. You know, somebody starts making arguments based on fiqh and fatwa and all these things. And they don't even know what it is that they're arguing. But the, the obligation in this case has got some conditions to it. So some argue that the obligation was individual because sound knowledge of God relies upon sound reasoning. And others say that it was collective because the religion is made safe by protecting its beliefs. And that has to be done through the use of reason. This is the opinion of Imam Al-Yusi and of Imam Al-Ghazali in the Ihya. So... It, what they're arguing is that it's not fard ayn per se, it's more fard kifaya, a sort of a collective um, obligation that, you know, people should study that. Like after learning the fard ayn, you should study logic. And, you know, people were taught, young students were taught logic in madrasa. You should study logic because it helps you further safeguard the religion from externalities through the use of reason. And these are opinions, by the way, we're talking about these opinions going back, you know, 500 years, six, seven, 800 years prior. We're dealing with a kind of world today whereby these opinions collectively would actually be argued that it is, it is absolutely necessary and it might even be categorized as for dying, in my view. Because the kind of situations that we're dealing with, these, these arguments provide, presented from you know, the, the secular world, the kind of education that is being given in schools and the kind of theories that are being propagated, as far as even our children are concerned, I'm not, I'm not talking about children like below the age of you know, 14, 15, probably at that age would be appropriate to learn logic. But... This something like this would be instrumental in helping them identify at least the, the fallaciousness of these arguments in light of Quran and Sunnah. To be able to oppose this rather than that, because the arguments that are presented are very sound. You see, it, it seems very plausible until you start breaking it down and you examine it from an Islamic lens and then you start seeing the fallacies in there. But you need the instrument, you need the tool to be able to do that. The fourth opinion held by such formidable scholars such as Ibn Salah and Nawawi as Suyuti Ibn Taymiyyah is that preoccupation with logic is prohibited. Now, this is where you really need to examine this. However, our scholars concluded that they were actually prohibiting, what they were actually prohibiting was not logic per se, but rather philosophical logic 
specifically the metaphysical foundations of it and the false conclusions derived from them. On the contrary, logic is none other than the grammar of thought and recognizing its great utility in the arsenal of knowledge, our scholars codified it and purified it of any ungrounded epistemic speculations contained in philosophical logic. Furthermore, given that the cause of the prohibitions was removed, the effect became null and void. The reason being that in a legal ruling based upon scholastic opinion, a cause cannot be disassociated from an effect in its presence or in its absence. So the prohibitions that these individuals made was not prohibitions against logic itself, but against what was what logic was being used for. And in specific, it was the philosophical speculations and getting into metaphysical arguments and drawing false conclusions. Because number one, logic doesn't work in metaphysics. You can apply logical reasoning in some metaphysical arguments, but really going into the in-depth of it to get the complete or the totality of it is going to give you wrong conclusions. Because people were now trying to speculate about these kind of things, you know, like what is the rule? You know, is it like this? Is it like that? Um, trying to get to understand the nature of it. Well, that's a metaphysical entity and your logic of this world will not apply to that. You know, philosophical speculations that we're now going into now, speculative theology like Kalam, trying to understand the nature of God or the nature of his attributes and making or coming up with all these different, different arguments. This was problematic. Now, there were mutakallim at that time who were necessary. And in all generations, Imam al-Ghazali argues that such people are necessary. The whole population does not need to do it. That's what the argument here is. It, it's an individual obligation, but the entire population does not need to do it. But you do need these people. You need mutakallim. You need philosophers. You need these people because these are the people who defend the religion from all these external influences that are coming in. You cannot defend the religion using aqidah and fiqh. This is where our scholars are stuck right now. They're trying to defend evolutionary biology using aqidah. Nonsensical, you see? Or trying to, to argue things like secularism using fiqh and aqidah. Secularism is the very core of atheism, really, because that's what it's about, the removal of God from and religion from state affairs permanently. How do you argue that? You need people who are trained in that. And logic is one of those instruments because you can't study philosophy without logic. You can't study theology without logic. You can't do all this because how do you analyze the arguments presented? And then how do you counter those arguments? Well, even if you're not on that level of countering those arguments, at the very least, it is a useful tool that will help you analyze and recognize what the issues are. And, and how do you categorize them so that you don't get swayed away by those arguments? If you don't learn to intellect, if you don't learn to philosophize, someone else is going to philosophize for you. So this is what he's saying. Uh, logic is, is none other than the grammar of thought. Because if the grammar of speech helps you articulate and speak properly, logic is the grammar of thought. It helps you classic clarify your thoughts. It helps you establish a sound internal epistemology. So insofar as the prohibition, this is what the, the, the principle is. Could you, could you mute yourself, whoever that is? The, the cause always revolves around the effect both in its existent state and non-existent state. If the, if, the, if, if the cause is existent, then the effect is also existent. If the cause is non-existent removed, then the effect is also removed. In this case, the cause of the prohibition, the effect is the prohibition on it. So what causes a prohibition? Then the prohibition comes in effect. So if I have a plate of food here and it's got impurities in it like pork or it's made of some alcohol or whatever it is then the prohibition to consume that food becomes uh, active on me means the cause is there for the prohibition to be in effect 
but if that food is purified removed and 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 or replaced and pure food is brought which is halal in this case then the prohibition to consume it is also removed so in so far as logic is concerned our scholars went through the entire process of purifying it of removing all these debatable aspects that were there in aristotelian, aristotelian logic that were there in kalam they were there in philosophy many books and refutations were made against that that has helped purify so when you look at the isagogy right now you find that it is just logic that's all there is there are no other arguments in there it's just pure logic and all it's doing is helping you uh, train your mind so that the cause now is removed and therefore the prohibition no longer ap applies since the prohibition this is these are my notes since the reason for the prohibition was philosophical speculations and these false metaphysical conclusions then the ruling for prohibiting it remained. But when these entities were removed, the, 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 or anything similar to it, or anything related to these kind of things, when these are removed, then the prohibition also gets removed. Because there's no sense on keeping the prohibition there. What are you prohibiting? You've already purified it. Why would you prohibit that which is pure, that which is beneficial? And so it then becomes permissible to use it for its benefits. But when these other externalities come back in effect, then the prohibition applies again. That's the principle that is applied in reconciling all these differences of opinions about its recommendation, uh, its obligation, its necessity, prohibition, permissibility, all that. The idea here is that for what is the instrument being used for and to what limits and what boundaries and what are the contents of it? If those are deemed to be pure and righteous and beneficial, then there is no prohibition on it. But when you start bringing in all these other aspects and you start applying logic, for example, trying to, you bypass the tafsir and you apply logic directly to the Quran. Or now I've studied logic. So you open Sahih Bukhari and you start analyzing hadith because you've studied logic. Well, you're going to develop your own religion. And that's what a lot of people do. Now that becomes prohibitory. Because, again, going back to the previous opinion of Imam Taqiyuddin, logic is, it can only be, uh, based on his opinion, what does he say? Permissible for those whose intellect is sound and those who have knowledge of the Quran and Sunnah. I'll give you an example. Imam Ali said, if religion was based on reason, I'm paraphrasing or something of the sort. If religion was based on reason, I would have wiped the bottom of my soul. But I saw the prophet wipe the top of his foot, the sock, the leather sock. I saw the prophet wipe the top. Why? Well, reason tells you that the soul is what touches the ground and that's where the dirt is. So reason will tell you that's the part that you need to clean. But he's saying, I saw the prophet wipe the top of his foot, not the bottom. If religion was founded on reason, I would be making my own religion. And then Omar would have made his own religion. And Abu Bakr would have made his own religion. And then you'd have Islam. Everybody's doing their own thing. This is one of the things that has happened with Christianity. In the West, it's very prevalent. You have so many different types of churches now. Each one is its own thing. And then you also have now, you know, around the corner, there is the, like the, there's just a house and there is the pastor and his flock is his wife and his children. And that's their own church. And they have their own Bible and they have got their own verses that they've made up from that. And it's their own religion. That's what happens. That segregation happens because each individual ends up applying their own thinking. This is what I think it is. I think this is what the ayah is saying. I think this is what the Quran is saying. I've seen people do that. I think Surah Fatiha says this and that. This is what I think it says like that. You think does not make it so. That's the limitation that you need to understand. If you do not understand the limitation on yourself, don't get into logic. Don't, don't study it. <laughs> it's better you don't get into it. This is what Ibn Taymiyyah's opinion was. Preoccupation with logic, it can lead people astray, especially the ignorant ones and, and the fools. So that's... We're going to stop there and we went a little bit over time.
I had the adhan for Maghrib, so we'll stop here, inshallah. Next week, we will start on the Isa Guji. <clears throat> Start. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, sir. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Uh, sir, uh, I, just, I just want to confirm one thing. You say that the limitation of logic, it is, on, it is only limited. It cannot be applied to Quran and the uh, Hadith and Tafsir. Is that right? Is that what I understand? No, no. What I said was the application of logic is only applied to this physical world of ours. Okay, and, okay, okay. Yeah, and and only with with language. Only language. The, okay. The science of logic is dealing with language. The words that we appropriate to things. That's what logic is for. When we start, inshallah, the introduction next week, I'll explain in detail what that means. Like, what does it mean as far as only application to language? Can everybody hear someone saying no sound? Are you able to hear me, those who are on the Zoom? Because uh, yes, Ustad, uh, we can hear you. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Go ahead, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Uh, Ustaz, from what I understood uh, of logic, uh, uh, it uh, comprises of what we call basic maths, that is the analytical reasoning part of it, and a lot of it is language. So, am I correct in saying that uh, math, this basic maths, that is this analytical uh, reasoning and the um, elementary maths and language are uh, all the all the, the components of logic or it's, is it something else well As you have well? the right you have the right understanding but the wrong application of the terms because math itself is language math mathematics is language it's uh, all the sciences are languages by themselves so what it's applying to is the analytical part as well as the synthetic part. That's essentially the terms you're looking at, the analytics of things and then synthetics of things. So mathematics is a language. Itself. When you say one plus one equals two, each of those is a word. One is a word, plus is a word, equals is a word, two is a word. It's just a word that denotes a certain quantity. But it is uttered insofar as speech is concerned. It's part of language. It's just a purely analytical language as compared to maybe poetry, which is purely synthetic. It's metaphorical. But logic applies to both of those, the analytical and the synthetic. And what uh, do you mean by synthetic? Synthetic is more uh, fluid in that sense. So you, you call like uh, metaphors, right? Metaphors are very dynamic. There are nuances and subtleties. So the things uh, that are related to our thoughts? Come again? Is that uh, what is related to our thoughts? Uh, yeah, yes, 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 yeah. Thoughts, thoughts are in that sense. Thoughts are synthetic. They, 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 they take, uh, they, they undergo a process of formulation, right? So a thought doesn't begin in its definitive state. It goes through a process that is mainly fluid. It changes, it morphs, it grows until it finally comes into something that is what you would call from crude shape into something that is formulated. It has now a form. And so you've got formal logic that deals with that form, the imago, the thought that is formulated, and then material logic that deals with the contents of that formulation. So an idea, for example, uh, I have an idea to start a business selling such and such items. So that's the idea. That's the form, right? And then there are the components in that form that would I would use to reason out why is it a good thing to do. 
is it is it functional is it probable is it plausible is it this this is me analyzing the thought itself so okay. that's Thank that's you. the synthetic part yeah Uh, uh sir mm -hmm. uh sir i just want I just want to ask one more question because i cannot understand uh i don't understand much of that like um uh, when when uh, logic has to be applied uh it's support we have to first uh study the quran and uh and hadith and everything then logic can be applied there no, 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 no. What he meant was that you have a working knowledge of the Quran and Sunnah, and then you can start studying logic as an instrument that helps you further your understanding. So you don't need logic to understand Surah Al-Ikhlas or, or, okay. or to understand the ahkam of it. You don't need logic for that. Right? So the principle that the scholars used was ahamuha qaidun thum al tasawufun wa alatun biha shuru'ah. And so the first and foremost is aqidah and prince, uh, the, the belief principles. Then there are the branches of practice, which is like, you know, the fiqh itself. Then there is the tasawwuf, purification of the self, making one a better person. Then wa'alatun biha shurur. Then by an instrument, you start beginning. You, you, you initiate the, the, the next step now. Well, logic is considered minal. From the instrumental sciences. So that's the instrument that you would pick. And it's one of the first instruments. Some scholars argue that it's that grammar is the first instrument, then you study logic, which I think is, is much uh, a much better opinion. To study grammar first, and so you understand the sentences themselves, then you study logic that helps you better analyze. Uh, text because again logic is dealing with the text we're dealing with the, okay, the okay. word language yeah okay so um i just only want to repeat it again so first it is a quran the teaching and then uh, logic is the instrument to use in order to uh in order to uh, understand or to applicate it yeah well to go further now to go deeper into it Okay, okay, no, I understand. Thank you very much. So you want to explore deeper. Like you want to study eschatology, for example. You can't yes. just open the double fitan and start studying all the hadith. Um, those require some analysis to be done, you see, and you need the right instruments to do this analysis. But you don't need logic to know uh, that the Quran and the Sunnah, the religion prescribes that you pray five times a day. You don't need logic for that. You just need to follow the guideline that has been given. So that comes first, and then, so those are your fardain, and then comes the fard kifaya. And so the most dominant opinion regarding logic is that it is fardain. Uh, sorry, fard kifaya. It comes second. It's obligation, but it's secondarily obligatory, not primarily obligatory. Okay, thank you very much. Shikil Arias, uh, you may please unmute yourself and ask the question. Mm -hmm. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. A small question uh, is when the idea comes in the form of text, it's still called like a form, or I need to know like what is form. Like uh, you said that if the concept in a mind or the idea, mm -hmm. then it's form. But if I written it down in a text, is it still a form? Yeah, it's a form, but it's now an external form, right? It's it's no longer an internal form. Okay. So it's still a it's still a form. It takes on a form, but it's taking on a written form now. Or if I speak it out, then it takes on an oral form. If it's still in my mind, then it is a mental form or an imaginative form. But it's still a form. So That's if you're reading the definition text, of form, it, yeah. Yeah, so the form is basically its structure. What is its structure? That's that's it. So it can have any structure. It can have a physical structure. Like this object has a physical structure, but I can close my eyes, not look at the object and close my eyes, and I can still have a mental form of that. That form, that's an imago or, or the image, is an imaginative form. 
I can write about this in description. I can write maybe a paragraph describing what this is without it being there. And that's a written form. Or I can speak about it. I can say there's a glass of water. It's made of glass. It's got half a glass. Of, it's got filled to halfway with water. It's clear. It's round. It's cylindrical. I can give descriptions about it. And, and I'm speaking it out. That's a spoken form um, or an oral form. But all those are forms. Yeah. 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 Anyone uh, else wants to ask any questions? So you may raise your hands, please. No, I think Ustad, we are, are done with the QA. We're done? Okay, Khairan, yeah. inshallah. Let's uh, convene next week um, and then we'll proceed with uh, the Isa Goji. So we'll end here. Subhanaka wa bihamdika nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta samyun alim. Wa tuba alayna ya maulana innaka anta tawabu rahim. Bi rahmatika ya arhamu rahimin. Barakallahu fikum. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakumullah khairan.